how will a four week delay affect you? And it might not even be, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm interested to speak to you if you work in hospitality, if you're in the wedding industry, if you're in something to do with theatre, something to do with night, any of those kind of areas that are demonstrably going to be affected. So there is obviously that. And I'd love to hear just how this pans out. I mean, weeks, days, in fact, can be the difference between a, a business continuing to succeed or just about keeping afloat an absolute abject failure. It can be that devastating. How will a four-week delay affect you? But actually, I think there's a wider issue. Even if you're not personally affected by the financials of the piece, and this isn't your industry or your area, I think it's a good argument to say this affects us all in one shape, form or another. 0344 499 1000. So we know, as far as we can tell, and the announcement... 6 p.m. this evening, live here on Talk Radio, that most coronavirus rules will remain in place for another four weeks after that planned June the 21st unlocking. Uh, This is according to government sources. Senior ministers have signed off on the decision to delay the lifting of all legal restrictions on social contact. That can mean capacity limits for sports areas, pubs, cinemas, all of that will remain and nightclubs will remain closed. Boris Johnson, as I say, expected to make this announcement official at six o'clock this evening. The extension will be put to a commons vote this month and could trigger could trigger a sizable um, conservative backbench rebellion. We're going to speak to Damien Green um, in this hour because Damien's got a kind of a, if you like, a hybrid halfway measure of dealing with this uh, that might be better and that I think I mean he'll tell us in his own words in just a bit but I think that may well be looking at this maybe two weeks in and saying okay where are we now two weeks in Uh, will there be enough Tories on the back benches to rebel against this to make a difference there's certainly a lot of annoyance of course we were due to move to stage four of the government's roadmap On the 21st of June, that would have been a week today. Venues, events would have been allowed to operate without capacity limits and the cap on guests at weddings would be lifted. And right there, you've got a crucial... I mean, can you think of a worse time of year when people are planning weddings? You know, what, July, August, those kind of things. And of course, you don't just plan it one day before. So people are waiting on hours and those hours will matter. They will make a big difference. 0344 499 1,000. Uh, many scientists have called for the reopening to be delayed to enable people to be va- more people to be vaccinated and receive second doses amid rising cases of the Delta variant or the Indian variant, depending on your choice of words. Um, as far as I know, now Boris Johnson also said yesterday that more people are ending up in hospital. I'm not absolutely sure that is completely correct. Um, when you look at the data, and remember data, not dates. That was the big thing, wasn't it? Data, not dates. We're not just going to willy nilly say 21st of June and, you know, doesn't matter what else is going on. No, it's about the data. Well, if you look at the data, the data at the moment, the big headline of all the data would tell you that we have over half the adult population who've had both vaccinations. Over, well over half on that. And of course, many more people as well who've had the first dose too. Uh, the most vulnerable group, I feel it feels ridiculous to even be repeating this kind of stuff. The most vulnerable group are pretty much all double vaccinated. And that, of course, was the whole point from the word off that don't worry. You know, once the vaccination is there, once we can target the most vulnerable, either because of age or because of an underlying health condition, then we're absolutely right on the right path. The roadmap is good to go. It's good and proper. I feel we've been lied to. I genuinely look at this. I can't find, I stand to be corrected, I can't find the data that backs up the delay. And that's the problem, right? I can't find it. I've looked for the data that backs up the... I hear scientists say, well, we better be careful. And the other thing that's happening as well, I think a couple of people already emailed on this, making the point that, you know, if you have a positive test, if somebody tests positive, that doesn't necessarily make them a coronavirus case, as in spark out on a bed completely and utterly banjaxed by a virus you might have just tested positive and that's assuming the test was correct in the first place and there's whole areas and rafts of controversy around that 0344 499 1000 if you work in those industries in that area of hospitality even in pubs that are open at the moment but with 
credible rules and regulations. So at the moment, we do have that issue where nothing can really carry on as normal. So those pubs and bars and restaurants that have been able to reopen, aren't they're not sitting out the back counting the wonga of an evening. They're sitting out the back working out how they can pay the loans and the debts they've accrued over the last year. So weeks do matter. That's the whole put the a, a month could be the difference between make or break on this. This is pandemonium in the government. Does Boris Johnson even know what is happening in his own government? Do the scientists really know what Boris Johnson should ultimately, as the man who is our leader, is requiring of them? Can you leave a bunch of scientists to their own devices? The same as any other industry. Of course, you know, never give the, the talent the checkbook, as they say. Because they will sing from their own hymn sheet. Well, based on our data, we think. So we've got more people with the Indian variant. Our more ended up in hospital at the moment. I'm not seeing any data around that. I stand to be corrected. I, I'm not seeing any data around that. 0344 499 1000. So give us your overview. How will a four-week delay affect you? Whether it will affect you personally because of the nature of your business or just affect you as a citizen of this country? How do you feel about an extra... 28 days. And here's the thing. So a clergyman from a, a prominent Church of England parish yesterday condemned the commemoration of Captain Sir Tom Moore as a cult of white British nationalism. I'm struggling to believe I'm even using these words. This is the Reverend Gerald Robinson Brown said in his social media page, the cult of Captain Tom is a cult of white British nationalism. I will offer prayers but I will not be joining the national clapping. This man is a bit dangerous. This is a race-baiting fool. I think we can all need to get that out of the way to begin with. Last night, the nation clapped a war hero. We clapped an NHS hero. We clapped a centenarian. We clapped decency. This was too much, however, for Reverend Jarrell. He couldn't take it anymore. The left-leaning man of the cloth was clearly hyperventilating at this. Everything he hates, all encapsulated in one simple act, namely the display of British decency. The whole thing came tumbling down on Reverend. Everything he loathes in life all collided at exactly the same time. He later, by the way, he said, I, I offered an unreserved apology for the insensitive timing. It's not about just about your timing, mate, of the tweet. And what I said regarding the clapping for Tom. How did this man find race in this issue? 0344 499 1000. There is a type. I think I've identified this. It's a kind of an anti-British disposition. You don't have to be foreign. You don't have to be from a particular ethnicity to suffer from this condition. Lots of indigenous white lefties have this in bucket loads. It is a condition. So when dear old Rev Jarrell hit the post button on his mad tweet. Curiously, I can actually see how the delicate mechanics of his mind were working. Those cogwheels were turning, but something was wrong. He was getting a code red alert over there at Reverend HQ. Everything about the clapping, the wider admiration for Sir Tom was playing royal havoc with every sinew of his being. He hated this and then made some amazing leaps of misplaced judgment. His mind was in the sewer, his hippocampus had spasmed and he began to imagine things. You know how it works. What he'd done is exactly what so many people do in these situations. He'd correlated and connected lots of different things that he finds annoying. And this story had everything in it, which is why the man discombobulated when he realised not only did we have this hero called Captain Sir Tom Moore, who'd sadly died, we were about to offer him a good old British round of applause as well. And this was too much for the right reverend. Everything about it, a bygone era, the war, a man with medals, an old white soldier, the knighthood, national pride. It sent the reverend over the edge of the pulpit. The race baiting chapter and verse, we could say, was through the roof. His ecclesiastical reverence and the very words he preaches were out of the window faster than the landing of a plague of locusts. What happened to the good book, Reverend Jarrell? That's what we want to know. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. 
Unless you're white and British, then you can sod off to, well, Sodom, one assumes. How did this man find race in this story? 0344 499 1000. It is just beyond the realms of extraordinary that you could look at anything about the Sir Tom Moore story and extrapolate a an offensive or a racist component to it. The only way you would be able to do that would be if you invented it, if you imagined it, and then you gave it some TLC, watered it a little bit, stuck it in a tweet and sent it out for your parishioners and the wider world to have a little butchers at. The cult of white nationalism. It hardly gets... I don't want to use the word offensive because... You know, we don't have the right not to be offended. But, I mean, if we can find a place for that word offence, then surely it sits here rather beautifully, uh, like the foot in the proverbial glass slipper. It just sits absolutely beautifully in that place. This is a design, it's an imagined, it's a wholly desired belief that everything about Sir Tom Moore, the, the backstory, the military man, the war hero, the white soldier, the double-breasted jacket with the war medals, and then the Queen comes along with her sword of joy, dobs on his shoulders and makes him a knighthood. My goodness, the day that happened, I'd hate to have seen the history of Reverend Jarrell's social media when the royal sword went onto the shoulders of Captain Tom Moore. That would have been a sight to behold had you been there. This man hates all of that stuff. I could, you'd imagine last night at the proms he probably set, spends with his head down the bowl. Uh, that's the kind of thing that would rattle Reverend Gerald. He doesn't like this stuff. So you correlate a load of things together and you decide that somewhere within this just beautiful story, uh, the story you couldn't write about Sir Tom. You just simply could not put that in a Netflix show and get away with it because it's so extraordinary what happened in the winter of his life that a man about to turn 100 raises £33 million for the NHS. He's a former war hero. He's now an NHS hero. He's now a knight. He's quintessentially British in all he stands for. This rattled Reverend Jarrell to the point that he discombobulated on social media and spewed his race-baiting hatred onto Twitter. Click. He had no qualms at the time of posting this. It's a man of the cloth, for goodness sake. This is a man that preaches understanding and love thy neighbour. This is a man that says diversity is key to our success as a human race. This is a man that stands in the pulpit on a regular basis and tells the masses in front of him that the way forward is through understanding each other, through understanding differences, through encompassing the beauty that is the human condition and allowing people, whether you are black or white, rich or poor, whoever you happen to be, the way we make this world go better in the eyes of God and Jesus Christ is absolutely to come together as one. I'm getting the vibe for the preaching thing. I'm channeling Reverend Jarrell. I can see him there of a Sunday up nice and early, polishing his shoes, whacking on the old dog collar and preaching his sermon. Can you imagine Reverend Gerald down there at the church saying, this sermon today is for everybody apart from you dodgy white folk. <laughs> we don't want you round here with your funny nationalist ways, clapping for war heroes, clapping for the NHS. Who do you think you are? He soon realised that he'd been a fool, by the way. He deleted what he'd written. And now I notice, and thanks to many of you that pointed out, um, He's actually deleted his entire Twitter account. I would imagine uh, they came for him. That's not a good look either. You're not going to battle or counter um, hatred or indignation or annoyance by employing the very same technique that you're attacking. So we don't want any of that. But I think we should expose his words and what he said and what it means. Because you know what? Reverend Jarrell is not alone. He's not the only person that has that... 
you know, it's a kind of, I imagine the boy Jones and pop-up Polly have a bit of that. Oh, I don't know what it is. I just don't like all this kind of flags and bloody soldiers and moustaches and white people. Who they think they are? Well, it's like most people, frankly. Oh, right, OK. Well, I don't like them. Fine. Um, and all that it stands for, because anyone who happens to be old and white and served in the military and got themselves a knighthood must be uh, some mad old white nationalist dodgepot. That seems to be the message that comes out there. They just don't. It, it's a contingent of twisted left wing thinking. It's really dangerous. It's as bad. The very racism that they might rightly attack. This is as bad. Race baiting, stirring it up, making up arguments is as bad as. How it's not an arrestable offence, I have no idea. I wouldn't just be arresting Piers Corbyn right now. I might knock on the door of the Reverend Gerald and have a word, frankly. How did he find racism in this story? Uh, now, here's the thing. Do you believe the government will drop COVID rules by the end of this year? Uh, you heard the voice of Charles Walker there. We'll talk to Sir Graham Brady on this programme in a few moments as well. Coronavirus laws will remain in place until September after MPs voted overwhelmingly for that extension, despite a Tory rebellion. So it was 484 Four, 76 against, that's a majority of 408, in favour of keeping powers in place until the autumn, despite Matt Hancock admitting he cannot rule out trying to renew them again. And this is the area that I've said it consistently. I know Julia talks a lot about this. We absolutely have to keep our focus on this. There's an extraordinary emission on some news sites. I'll come to that in a second. Kicking off the debate in the Commons, the Health Secretary was unable to guarantee that it was the last time MPs would be asked to roll over the powers which are largely unprecedented in peacetime. And I think it's that last set of words that we should really hold on to and just consider unprecedented in peacetime. Now, we know about the original lockdown. We understand the original lockdown. We know the reasons behind the original lockdown. And I think most of us supported the original lockdown. Here we are. Fast forward to 2021. It is March knocking into April and it looks as if vaccine program is doing rather well. Nine out of ten people of the most vulnerable, the most likely to sadly not make it through this virus, have all been vaccinated. Remember the golden words of our political master. Once the vaccination is with us, that's when things become a game changer. That is the point when you can look back and say, now we can begin easing the lockdown because we have a vaccine. Now these powers, and when you give powers such as this, unprecedented powers in peacetime to a government. We lend them those powers. We lend them the right to make controversial, unprecedented decisions when times are extraordinary, when times are challenging, when there is a pandemic around. We as the electorate, we'll, we'll nod that through. We're not comfortable. Uh, you shouldn't be comfortable. Nobody should be comfortable with any part of this story. I hope we all get that. We're on the same page in terms of giving your government powers to close down the country, the economy, your business, your livelihood. At the moment, as we sit here, just picture Matt Hancock for a second. Just think of Matt Hancock. I know he's been a bit of a patsy on this story, but just conjure up the image of Matt Hancock. You know, nobody knew this fellow a year ago, but he's the health secretary. Just think of dear old Matt. You think he's probably a guy about 60. He's 42, by the way. That should put the fear of God or satisfaction into some people. He, just think of Matt Hancock, OK? That man has the power to close your business. Just think of Matt. So you're not, you haven't got an image of a kind of typical totalitarian czar who's somehow in charge, who's picking off where he wants to close, the Caesar-like thumbs up or thumbs down. That man, along with his cohort, the Prime Minister, have the power... They've been given the executive power to close you down and to stop you from going swimming or to the city. In fact, everything that we look at as being a free society. That should terrify us all. It should terrify us all. I'm having some mischief with this. It should terrify us all, no matter who is in charge. OK, but just for one second, just think about the people making these decisions. And Parliament has given it the big fat green light to carry this on for six months. You should be bothered by that. Everybody should be bothered by that. The fact that this did not even make 
not just the front page of the BBC News website. Did you see this, Charlotte? Because I checked it out as well after we spoke this morning. So I thought it's not on the... How can something as big as this not be front and centre on the BBC News website? Something we pay hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to run. So no, so I thought, okay, I know what they've done. Okay, it's not an editorial decision I agree with, but what they've done, they've put it onto the coronavirus part of the website. So I clicked on the corona. They've got a special tab over there at the B. I clicked on that. Nothing. Nothing. What? A vote this big? No mention on the BBC website. In fact, the the stories on the coronavirus tab were all one day old or two days old. How can you not have the story? of a vote to extend pow unprecedented powers in peacetime. How can that not appear front and centre on the, the main page of the state-funded BBC News website? I thought I'd give them the benefit of the doubt. It's not on their front page. It's not on the coronavirus tab. Ah, I know where it is. It'll be under the politics section. That's what they've done over there at Beeb HQ. They put it in the politics section. Bit clumsy, but we'll let it slide. So off I go to the politics section. Nada, rien. Nothing's there. Absolutely zilch. Not a mention. Not a mention of a seismic, unprecedented vote in the House of Commons to close you down if parliamentarians decide it's the thing to do. This is so big, I cannot find a superlative, really, to kind of bolt on to this. It's just how gigantic in law and against the, the usual democratic processes this is. Now, it may well be for good reasons, and come October, they go, you know what, job done, fantastic, all sorted. Those powers are now rescinded. Parliament no longer has the power. The Prime Minister and the cohorts around the table at number 10 can no longer close things down. But as it stands right now... We have been asked to believe that despite the fact that the virus, uh, the vaccination for the virus is going great guns, despite the fact that we have vaccinated the most vulnerable group, the vast, vast majority of the most vulnerable group, the group that is likely to really be affected by this and the group that could die if they get this, have all been vaccinated. Give or take, all been vaccinated. But we still want to retain the powers. Any reason why, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Hancock, why you still want to retain such heady powers? Is it, is it something you're enjoying here? Are you just being guarded? Well, it might be. Six-month extension. And only, well, you heard it there, only 60, uh, 76 voted against. 0344 499 1000. It should frighten the living daylights out of ev everybody. I mean, look at the year we've just been through. Essentially, MPs yesterday voted to carry that on for another half a year if they want to. That's massive. It's huge. Don't let anybody dilute the severity of that. It's big. Uh, for some reason, the BBC decided probably doesn't warrant any coverage, really. Not over here at the BBC. We've got other things going on. I think we can talk about other things. Don't really nitty gritty of votes and covid laws and stuff it's just a matter of an unprecedented vote to keep our country closed it's huge it is huge 0344 499 1000 you heard charles walker there we'll talk to graham brady also these people voting against this these are the braver parliamentarians by the way these are the ones that are making sense to us right now do you believe the government will drop those rules by october 0344 499 1000 I am bemused, horrified and terrified that this is not the most controversial thing we've discussed in the last few months. And there's been a lot on the agenda. Why is that? Do you believe the government will eventually, as they say they want, Matt Hancock couldn't guarantee it. So what do you think? We're the electorate. We pay their wages. They work for us, remember. Who is right, Tyrone Mings or Pretty Patel? I, I loathe it when very serious, important issues kind of boil down to this kind of, 
um, divide, as it were. So we know that um, England footballer Tyrone Mings, for those unfamiliar with Mr Mings, I think he played, he got a game in, I think he came on as a sub in the Ukraine game. Uh, Villa player, England international, defender, all-round nice bloke. He's launched a bit of an attack on Pretty Patel, accusing her of stoking the fire of racism by labelling the team's taking of the knee as gesture politics. Now, I'm confused with all of this, and it all ties up with the racist abuse some players received after the European Cup final on Sunday. So here's what happened. Yesterday, Pretty Patel gave her opinions on those racist tweets. She described the abuse of England players as disgusting, and she joined the nationwide condemnation of those behind the messages. But apparently this was not good enough. Now, I don't th look, I know people, if, if you're not a Tory, then you will loathe Pretty Patel twofold. You will loathe her because she's a Tory and you'll loathe her because she's a non-white Tory. That will, for some people, drive them absolutely crackers. The idea that somebody who comes from an ethnic minority background could even be a conservative. When you throw Saji Javid into the equation, you've got discombobulation all round on the left in this country. Uh, and then you start getting to many other cabinet faces that are non-white in the Tory. What are the Tories doing having a diverse front bench in this kind of way? So just the mere existence of Pretty Patel does drive some people absolutely tonto. There's no doubt about that. But I don't think she would need any lessons in what it feels like to be on the receiving end of racist abuse. The idea that because she happens to be a Tory and has a different view on taking the knee means somehow any experience she's had is not being quite as bad as other people's experience. And I would say it's been very bad. I mean, she was well known a couple of years ago. She spoke very graphically, you may remember, in the House of Commons. She used the P word under the uh, qualified... Um, privilege of being able to say that in a parliamentary setting to describe the kind of abuse she had got. But she's a Tory and she's a woman and she's not white and that confuses a lot of people. So when she condemned and she absolutely condemned the abuse that some of our players got, and I think we're all in agreement, we said it yesterday, is that it ain't British, it ain't football and if that is you and if you endorse that kind of stuff, you're not in the club, mate. You're not part of this. You're not part of us. You're not part of what we stand for. Our standards, our morals, our background, our backbones for that matter. You ain't in the club. You're not welcome here. So we've established that. And Pretty Patel absolutely echoes that. So when she said yesterday that she described that abuse as disgusting and joined in that condemnation, this then provoked... Tyrone Mings to pitch back up again, this time on Twitter, because you do. And he said, you don't get to stoke the fire at the beginning of the tournament by labelling our anti-racism message as gesture politics and then pretend to be disgusted when the very thing we're campaigning against happens. I mean, there is so much wrong with all of this. I mean, are we really here? So when it comes to getting racism out of football, and if that is the the only issue, I mean, some say it's actually about racism more generally in society. Uh, but predominantly, I think we, we, when, when the knee thing happens, uh, then I, I suppose those people, Tyrone Ming, will argue it's about racism in football. Now, I've always argued that particular gesture is counterproductive. It's nonsensical. It's disproportionate. It doesn't quite work in the setting. And footballers don't get to decide what it means. Uh, they can have their own meanings, but they can't speak for anybody else. So there's a massive issue overtaking the knee, a huge issue. And particularly when you look at the great work that the Kick It Out campaign has done, show racism the red card, and we'll be talking about that in just a bit as well. Um, it's not an unreasonable position to say that you happen to think that taking the knee isn't the right way to highlight all of this, that you think it's it goes against the good work that's been done, does a lot of the good work that has been done as well. It's possible to have that view and to also believe that the tweets that were sent to several English players after Sunday's penalty shootout were outrageous and disgraceful, and those responsible should be, where possible, uh, brought to uh, to justice, to book, to to be held account 
for the miserable and offensive way they opine on a game of football. You can have both views, Tyrone Mings. You can have two views. It's completely possible. What is so hard for the left to understand about this? What is so difficult for people to get their head around the idea that you might genuinely, with every scintilla of your intelligence, think that the taking the knee thing is a no-no, it doesn't work, it's counterproductive, it goes against the grain, while simultaneously supporting all of the other anti-racism campaigns like Kick It Out and Red Card, etc. You can have two views. 0344 499 1000. And I am confused on the knee thing. Um, I'm confused as to who it's specifically aimed at. Is that whole gesture, the sweeping gesture, adopted from something Martin Luther King did in the late 50s and early 60s in the deep south of the United States, 5,000 miles away, and has never found its way into the culture of this country or many others. Is, it, is that gesture solely aimed at racist fans on Twitter? Is that really where we're at now? Are we aiming this at Matey sitting in his pants in a bedsit with nothing better to do than abuse Sucker and Rashford and co? Really? Is that it? Because everybody else standing in the stands thinks it's aimed at them. And there's your problem. That's why you get the booze. That's why you get people. I'm not defending. The booze, by the way, is probably a stupid way to respond to this. I, I can understand why people do, but it feeds right into the lap of those kind of left-wing commentators who think that because you boo, therefore you must be a mad racist because you're booing it. And all you're doing is showing, showing the only way you can to highlight your disquiet and your upset and disturbance, a, a gesture that you believe is surplus to requirements. That, frankly, no other international football team seem to be adopting either. 0344 499 1000. I mean, I've said this, I used the analogy, didn't I, a little while back. If you could imagine that every day in the workplace, when you got into work, there was going to be a minute silence at 10 past nine to advance the issue of equality and gender diversity in the workplace. Well, it's got better, it's not perfect, still not enough women in top positions. Not enough women getting paid the same money. So every day when you come into work, you're going to, uh, we're going to have a minute silence at 10 past nine. And you'd think, well, that, that's kind of strange. That does seem to be, you know, perhaps quite a grand way of addressing the issue. If you discovered that they were going to have, I don't know, your TV screens were going to go blank at 6 p.m. every Friday evening, as we remember the victims of anti-Semitic abuse, an area that's been a problem historically, and continues to be a growing problem. So you turn your TV on every Friday, six o'clock. It'll just be a dark screen with a star of David there and uh, a, a brief line so that people remember the plight of those who are victims of anti-Semitism. I mean, if you did all of these things, you'd think, well, this is, these are rather big nets to, to catch relatively few fish. They're all important and nobody is arguing that they're not important. It would be seen as a bit preachy, a bit disproportionate. Why are you aiming something at all of us when the majority are more than aware of these problems, more than on board, and in many cases active in eradicating these problems? Who doesn't support the Kick It Out campaign? Who doesn't support the Red Card campaign? So Tyrone Rings is completely wrong in his assertion that you can't hold two views. You really can. Why are we dictating to people that you have to be in one camp or the other and if you're not you are surplus to the requirements so the booing is probably not the best response because it feeds into the very argument that the others are constructing against you that said i don't know how else you make your points known all i would say again and i'm repeating myself is that if you were a pr company coming in to advise on the best way to get a campaign going about getting racism out of football you'd probably say this one isn't working so let's move on to something else. And that something else already exists in Kick It Out and Red Card and the like. So Pretty Patel apparently can't hold views. Who is right on this, Tyrone Mings or Pretty Patel? I want to bring you this. Uh, we thought long and hard about this as well, because there's a, a whole raft of things going on at the moment. And sometimes you know, the, the, we know that the big story uh, of coronavirus never really leaves us for more than a few minutes. Um, but it is worth just looking at some positive headlines here. Um, 
part of the DNA, I probably don't need to tell you this, but for those who are new to the flock here at, at Talk Radio, part of the, the, the DNA here is that uh, this station has always been incredible at talking positively about stories that warrant a positive response and a phone-in and comments from you. And if you look around the media, all too often... It is doom and gloom. I mean, I mentioned the other day, Hugh Pym at the BBC has pretty much moved in to an intensive care unit. He's there so often. He's certainly on the Christmas card list, that's for sure. Uh, and it's true that when there are headlines out there that deserve to be looked at from a positive angle, we absolutely should do exactly that. So there's a little bit of an apology there, because I'm aware in the last couple of months some of the stories have been tricky and they've been a bit uncomfortable and we've been talking coronavirus and all that goes along with that. And that, by definition, you know, there's not a lot of positivity that comes out of that story. But So therefore it's unashamedly worth a trip down this particular avenue and ask the question about Project Fear, in particular Project Fear. The world is going to come to an end if we leave the European Union. Um, within six months, I'm thinking out loud here, within six months there will probably have to be a, a budget to deal with the fact that unemployment will rise within the first year by, I think, what was the figure that George Osborne gave? A loaf of bread was going to cost you about 50 quid. Three million people would be unemployed. I mean, the list went on. It was doom and gloom and I was looking at this thing wow this sure is a really bad idea right this this Brexit thing is this really going to happen and I thought hang on a sec and I know I'm repeating the line here coming out the EU was never or being in the EU was never an act of physics it was a man-made trading block that we decided to join and for many people, that was absolutely the right decision, particularly back in the 70s when the original common market vote went out and people thought, well, that seems pretty good. You know, we, we've had a rough old time under the socialists here in the UK. Maybe we'll fare a little better in a, a, a wider setting uh, with an EU trading deal. And so we joined and 40 odd years later, we left again. We had a little look round, enjoyed it for a moment, didn't like much what we saw and put the democratic vote out there and left. And, of course, the arguments were plentiful. I kept thinking of all the arguments that you could have about Brexit. It seemed extraordinary to me that anybody would be claiming that it was a, a, either an economic or a trading impossibility to be outside of it. It just seemed lunacy to me because you've only got to point to most other countries that are not in the EU. Now, we might have had a tasty trade deal with the EU because we were part of the EU. And that means there's a bit of a bumpy road to get some semblance of normality back in that. I understand that. I know the fishing industry is having a bit of a torrid time on this very point. But the idea that you couldn't you couldn't get out of something that was just a trading. It just seemed anti-intellectual mumbo jumbo. And this was wheeled out day in, day out. And Osborne claiming, that was he claimed that leaving the EU would leave every family £4,300 worse off. And he wrote this on the back of a cigarette packet, of course. And they were arguing their, their cause and others were arguing the other side. But it just, it, it seemed ridiculous, a ridiculous notion to argue that it wasn't possible to be outside of the EU. That just seemed like a, an act of gross stupidity to throw this out. Why would it not be possible? How do you fare in Japan? How do they fare in New Zealand, Australia, Pakistan, India, all over the world? How do you fare outside the EU? What, what's, why couldn't another country that currently is in the EU do the same thing and fare just as well as those countries outside of the EU? So was Project Fear a big fat lie? Let me put it to you like that. 0344 499 1000. I think sometimes when we do phone-ins like this uh, there's an assumption that I only want to talk to people who are going to agree with me what would be really tasty is to speak to people who completely disagree with this point and have a very different view on this um, and I was taken really to this there were two things that were happening today there was some great economic news that it looks as if we're going to be out of the the doldrums quicker than we thought post coronavirus financially speaking that you know within the next year we should be back to pre-pandemic levels so that's some good news. But it was the Cadbury story that got me. I know this is one company and therefore not in itself, but I'll come on to the others, not in itself 
uh, the, the totemic answer to why post-Brexit will be fantastic. But it's very significant that a company like Cadbury that was bought out several years ago by Mondelez International, which owns the brand now, decided to return to the Bourneville factory, uh, where back in the, what, the 1870s, Bourneville chocolate, Cadbury chocolate bega began. Extraordinary. 15 million quid's worth of investment in the Birmingham site, the company said, from 2022. Um, and they'll be making thousands and thousands of tonnes. Bourneville produced 35 tonnes of Cadbury dairy milk tablets. 234 million bars. Did you know that? Uh, the investment will allow them to make an additional 12,000 tonnes of chocolate. So the significance of Cadbury coming back is absolutely vast. And of course, it comes on the back of Nissan, confirming that it will keep the Sunderland plant open for long term now that the trade deal is done between the UK and the EU. That plant employs 6,000 workers. Now, I know that a, a, a Remainer will say, well, we already had that deal. Why are we celebrating not losing something? Well, it is significant because Nissan have crunched the numbers. They've looked at this and thought, we employ 6,000 hardworking people at this plant, 70,000 people through the wider supply chain. Don't tell me that's not significant. 76,000 people are part and parcel of the brilliant story that Nissan will remain in Sunderland in this country. Nissan, Cabri. Do you want more? I've got more. Let me bring you Barclays. Barclays, for goodness sake, one of the biggest banks in the world. The UK, UK financial services industry should focus on competing with the USA and Asia rather than the EU. This is according, according to the boss. He's talking about life after Brexit. Jess Staley has said that although jobs that were originally created here have now moved to the EU, Britain gives one of the most important sectors the chance to define its own agenda. He said, I think Brexit is more positive on that side than negative. So when you have Nissan and Cadbury and the boss of Barclays making mood music like this, you have to take a very serious look at this story and say, you know what, it is early days. We're only, what, uh, six weeks into fully being out of the EU in the conventional sense. This picture is looking pretty good, right? Was Project Beer, Fear just a Project Beer? Uh, there was a lot of Project Beer after that referendum result. We know that. Project Fit, was it just a, a big tissue of whoppers, a huge fat lie? 0344 499 I'm bound to throw this as well into your own experience of your own company or organisation and what it's looking like. And if the news isn't pretty, well, we're all ears on that one as well. But if you are sensing that this Cadbury, Nissan, Barclay story is kind of forming beginning to form the early stages of a bit of a narrative. And that's what I'm thinking. So great optimistic news about the future of our economy, which we thought was going to be in the doldrums for a decade, could jump out of that within a year. That's great news. Massive companies like this saying post-Brexit's made either no difference or they'll continue to invest or they'll reinvest or they'll come back in the case of Cabris. There's a lot of good news here. Migrant crisis. This is broken record territory. This is Groundhog Day, deja vu, all of the above. How many times have we asked that question? The last time I looked, we have an entire department that is dedicated to things like solving the migrant crisis. It's a massive crisis, by the way. Don't let anybody tell you, regardless of where they sit on the political spectrum, that this is not a crisis. It is a crisis. 23,000 people have made that crossing from France so far this year. At what point do you say that the population of a small town, the equivalent of arriving illegally into another country is not an issue? How, how is that not splashed on your front pages almost on a daily basis? It's not a, an anti-immigration point. I have every consideration for the humanitarian plight of those that are making the crossing. I've got every understanding of the perilous nature of making the crossing. But the irredeemable reality is that 23,000 people is an awful lot of people to just suddenly pitch up within one year, less than one year, 10 months, into one country and for there to be no knock-on effect of that. 
In a single day, this was the record yesterday. A thousand people arriving, five lifeboats and four border force vessels escorted groups to Dover as a period of calm and mild weather made the journey less risky. You'll be seeing some of the images on our TV feed if you're looking at us in moving pictures. A white horse source accused France of losing control of the situation. The Home Office said British people did not want to see people die in the channel as ruthless gangs profit. Well, that bit is true. So we've got more than 23,000 people have made the journey so far this year. About 90% of people who arrive in the UK then, of course, apply for asylum. I'm not sure what happens to the rest. So what is the answer? Because no politician can supply the answer. The British can't supply the answer. The French can't supply the answer. Immigration lawyers can't supply the answer. Humanitarian organisations can't supply the answer. Human rights groups can't supply the answer. Migrant organisations can't supply the answer. Nobody can supply the answer. So can we ask, in layman's terms, let's just get some everyday thinking about this. Can you supply the answer? What do we do about this? How do we solve this crisis. It is a crisis. 0344 499 1000. And where is Pretty Patel? Where is the Home Secretary? She made the case very loudly, many times. But where the heck has she gone? She's like that, you know, the shady tradesman that you book to fix your fence or paint your house. You've paid the deposit, but he never turns up. You try and call him but there's no answer. You send multiple texts, nothing. And then you get a call with a spectacular array of excuses. The dog died. My nan had COVID. The car broke down. But don't worry, I'll be there on Monday, he says. Phew, Monday comes. He doesn't show up. He guaranteed Monday. Where the heck is he? More calls, more texts. And then on Thursday, his mate shows up with a paintbrush, does an hour's work and then legs it. The excuses keep piling up. Eventually, you give up. The painter is not coming and neither is Pretty Patel. 0344 499 1000. She was painted as the saviour of all of this. Various home secretaries, even previous Tory ones. Sajid Javid did the job before Pretty Patel. Theresa May did the job, the longest serving home secretary, before Mr Javid took on the portfolio. None of those people managed to solve it. But don't worry, everybody. Pretty is coming. And she turned up with a lot of mood music and a big bag of promises. Pretty Patel was going to do what the others couldn't. She was going to go there. Others said, well, we will, but they never did. Oh, no. Pretty was going to do things very, very differently. Pretty Patel was the one to solve the problem. In fact, she was going to solve many, many problems. It wasn't just this one. This was just a, a bit of a biggie. It was right on the top of the list over there at the Home Office. Get the big job, become Home Secretary, sort the channel migrant crisis. I've forgotten how many phone-ins we did when it was suggested that Pretty Patel might be a future Home Secretary. And I took caller after caller. We need Pretty Patel. She's the one that will solve it. She's the one that will make it happen. She's the one, not just with the initiative, but the desire the political desire to sort this out, the logical desire to sort this out, the kind of robust brain that is needed to sort this out. She could understand, she could empathise, she has her own immigrant backstory to fall back on as well in that respect. If anybody could do it, Pretty Patel could do it. People were sold on Team Pretty. And of course... She's now, what, two years into the job. She ain't done nothing. Diddly, frankly, it's got worse under Pretty Patel. The threat of some, having someone who's a little more right wing has clearly not put anybody off. If you're over there in Calais waiting to make that journey to the United Kingdom, of all the things you might be thinking that are going to stand in your way, the people traffickers are going to let you down. The dinghy won't be there. The French authorities might get you before you get a chance to even leave. It could turn out to be a torrid night with tempestuous winds and the danger zone is at full, uh, full pelt on the radar. Could die making that crossing. They, they would be the considerations. Not one of those migrants have gone, ooh, 
Pretty Patel might be there. No one said that because nobody gives a hoot about Pretty Patel. Nobody's bothered about Pretty Patel because Pretty Patel has done naff all on this. Absolutely nada. Rien. And here's the thing. What should Boris Johnson's roadmap look like? 0344 499 1000. We have some detail. They've done the spoiler alert that uh, seems to be the normality now whenever there's a big announcement. Get it with budgets, don't you? Sort of know the whole budget uh, about four days before the budget. Uh, and now with this, we've got some detail. All schools are to open in England on the 8th of March. We've already got detail, of course, on Wales and Scotland. This is part of the Prime Minister's cautious four-part plan. Note those words, a four-part plan to lift the coronavirus lockdown. Mr Johnson will share his finalised roadmap with ministers before unveiling it to MPs and then leading a news conference at seven this evening. So we understand up to six people or two households will be allowed to meet outdoors from the 29th of March. This is according to the vaccines minister, Nadim Sahawi. Uh, rules lifted at stages and four conditions must be met at each stage. So the first stage, 8th of March, all schools reopen with outdoor after school sports and activities allowed. Recreation in a public space, such as a park, will be allowed between two people. How does that work? With a, well, there's no football then, right? Uh, meaning they would be allowed to sit down for a coffee, a drink or a picnic. Oh, bless. 29th of March is a big old leap three weeks away from the first announcement. A outdoor gatherings of either six people or two households will be allowed. It's understood this will include gatherings in private gardens. Outdoor sports facilities such as tennis or basketball courts will reopen and organised adult and kids sport like grassroots football there it is, it's back, will return and the list goes on 0344 499 1000. What do you want to see Boris's roadmap look like? What, what should be on there that isn't on there? Because there is a big old school of thought that, you know, let's get this thing moving. And we heard the incredible news today about vaccines, uh, that the reduction in hospital admissions looks absolutely extraordinary at the moment. The details on that are, are, are so encouraging that one would assume that it would be an utter game changer. And this information, uh, how or whether it was kept private beforehand i've got no idea but what we do know this information chimes brilliantly with what we're hearing today about the easing of the lockdown and of course the answer goes or the conclusion goes that if you if, if the vaccines are working was it 85 percent fewer people turning up in hospital so massive success for the vaccine deployment that is surely the recipe for unlocking I noticed the headlines today, a recipe for never unlocking. Tories slam Boris's four tests as he prepares to announce all schools will return on the 8th of March. What are you making of this? I mean, the vaccine story is absolutely incredible. This data comes out of Scotland to begin with. The first proof that the vaccine rollout is working. Compelling real world data from Scotland shows one dose of either jab cuts the risk of being hospitalised by up to 95%. This is absolutely massive. When all of this happened, of course, right at the beginning and all the way through, the, the big line has been, well, until we get a vaccine, we've got to stay in some kind of lockdown. Even when we've eased the lockdowns over the last almost a year now, there's still been regulations in place. So you know, the, the masks in certain places, the, the, the di social distancing. Uh, restrictions in restaurants where instead of 30 tables there's only 15 so there's no, we've never been back to normality since the first lockdown and we were told forever that the one thing that's going to make the difference here will be the vaccine and so when the vaccine came along up until last week we were all rubbing our hands thinking this looks rather good now we have this today which looks like not inconclusive but conclusive proof that the vaccine rollout is working that having that first jab cuts the risk of being hospitalised by up to 95%. Game-changing, right? What are we waiting for, Boris? 0344 499 1000. What do you want that roadmap to look like? We know about schools. We've got a few morsels about outdoor activities. We're hearing that sitting together with your mate, having a coster on a park bench, will be given the green light. But that's kind of it. I'm juxtaposing this with the data about the vaccines and thinking to myself, hang on a sec, how long is this easing going to go on for? Well, we've got four months of easing to get through. 
Uh, the smart money, of course, from those who are opposed to opening up will be, well, we've got to wait and see. Well, we've got a vaccine that works in a way that I don't even think those that put the vaccine together imagined it could work. 95% fewer people ending up. You've got a 95%, 90, just hear the words, 95%. One dose of either jab cuts the risk of being hospitalized by 95%. We're not talking 58, 62, 70, 95%. I'm, I'm going to keep saying this because this is absolutely huge news. 95%. That to me, if you were the philosopher's favorite alien coming down to this planet and thinking, right, what do they do next? Well, you open up the country, surely. 95% vaccine, job done. Job done, Mr. Johnson. 0344 1000 And have you at the tipping point yet? Do you know the tipping point where the lockdown has actually begun to mush your brain? Even if you go to work. I go, go to work every day. I work in a different part of the area from where I live. So I live in Kent, work in London, jump on a train every day. I see people. I've got social activity in the sense that I, I can have conversations with other human beings mostly other human beings, and that's great. And you, you get a different, the optics are different, right? Uh, you can see life around you. Some people haven't even got that. So despite that, I'm still, the, the fatigue, I think, really kicked in this weekend. And interestingly, the weather was a little bit, it was like the first weekend, it hasn't either snowed, been minus four, or poured hard for the entirety of the weekend. So the weather was kind of all right. It wasn't even particularly cold. So you could go out for your little walk, your, your, your exercise, and kind of be all right with that. But there was still that sense. You can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. I walked past my local pub and thought, you know, nipping in for a bite to eat or just a pint would be absolutely lovely. This is going to send us absolutely nuts. I'm as mad as biscuits right now. I don't know what to do with myself. And I'm a bloke that can, can get out of the house and come to work and interact. So the idea of lockdown easing can't come soon enough because uh, we are going to be absolutely scuppered as mentally as a nation we're going to be absolutely scuppered if we don't get this thing up and running in the next four or five weeks and i think that's generous right four or five weeks surely oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand i want your stories on that i want your interpretation on what you think the prime minister might do or perhaps more crucially what he might not do and i'll put all of this under one question what should boris johnson's roadmap look like to you.